People hate Dylan Dennis. This is America and he's over there representing with them. No, seriously, people really hate Dylan Dennis. He's searching a little attention. I think he just wants to be a social media guy. He doesn't actually want to fight. A little a little teenage girl that wants to be famous. So much you're telling me he actually has to fight. Like how how you are still keeping up with this routine and this act is beyond me. You are a pointless stain on this earth. Why don't you get on TikTok, Dylan? Give it a bit of in this You. My name is Greg and I'd like to welcome you back to GK where we discuss all things boxing and MMA. In this video, I'll break down the life and career of Dylan Dennis and how he came to be known as MMA's biggest joke. I did a lot of research for this and from the bottom of my heart, you guys are welcome. Sitting through this man's awkward interviews has tested my patience in ways that I didn't think was possible. But I'm glad I persevered because while 90% of the material was really aggravating to get through, the remaining 10% made me see Dylan in a different light. And even provided some context for why he is the way that he is. But before we get to that, we have to talk about why he's disliked. And this will probably be the longest part of the video because over the years, this man has managed to piss off just about everybody he's ever crossed paths with. So grab some popcorn, kick back, and get comfortable because you're about to hear about the most annoying guy in mixed martial arts. Try hard, informal, derogatory, a person usually of little talent who tries hard to succeed, especially through imitation, usually to gain fame or popularity. This term perfectly describes Dylan Dennis. He's been somewhat well known within the MMA community for seven years now, and every single one of those years has been spent trying very hard to be Conor McGregor. It's unclear how the two first became acquainted, but Dylan was recruited into McGregor's camp as a jiu-jitsu coach prior to his rematch with Nate Diaz at UFC 202 in August of 2016. Connor was my idol, you know, I looked up to Connor. We had a lot of the same mindsets and I knew it would be good for me to go over there and train with him and then we became good friends. Like we, we had the same mindset and stuff. And At the time, Dylan was a promising young prospect competing out of Marcelo Garcia's Jiu Jitsu Academy in New York. He had just been awarded his black belt the year prior after a run as one of the best brown belts in the world, having submitted several guys that would go on to become world champions in both gi and no gi competition. If you go back and look at his Instagram posts around this time, you'll see a young man that was clearly obsessed with jiu-jitsu but presented himself in a humble way. There's a post about how happy he was to become the 2014 IBJJF world champion, a picture of him gifting kites to some kids in Brazil, and even a post about him losing and leaving everything on the mat. But if you pay close attention, in late 2015, there was a subtle shift where he began to copy Conor McGregor. It all started with this picture, posted the month after Conor posted this picture. Then we get this caption several months later reading, they don't move like I move, which is a direct quote from Connor. They don't move like I move, they don't think like I think, and they don't talk like I talk. And several months after that, presumably after he entered McGregor's camp for UFC 202, Dylan began to post pictures with Connor, copying his poses and even writing captions that sounded vaguely like things that he would say, such as calling himself a Don. Eventually, this evolved into trying to dress like Connor and posing for pictures in the same exact way that he did. Now, copying Connor isn't exclusive to Dylan Dennis. It's also been done by Kevin Lee and to a Small degree, Artem Lobov. Ahead, Artem. Injuries, sicknesses, big weight cuts, hurricane Ophelia, you can't stop the Siberian Express. Choo choo, motherfuckers. And that was also cringe and didn't go unnoticed. Let Connor be the personality on this team because he's clearly the one with the personality, not Artem or the rest of the guys. Connor's like the, the hot chick that will only hang out with ugly girls. But Dylan Dennis did it so blatantly that it became pretty much the only thing that he was known for. A good example of how bad it got would be this segment from an interview he did with Ariel Hawaii where he felt compelled to explain the choice to dye his hair blonde because people online were saying he did it because he wanted his hair to naturally be blonde like Conor McGregor. It's a big thing in jiu-jitsu, like the, a lot of favela kids all dye their hair blonde, you know, and like for the world I did it because like their, their passion kind of goes on to me and like I kind of felt like I'm fighting for all of us because I feel like there's a lot of crazy articles out there talking about why I did it, so I'm happy we cleared this up. Well, what are they saying? Saying that no. I died because Connor has blonde hair. As if mimicking the way Connor looked and posted on social media wasn't embarrassing enough, Dylan didn't stop there. He also attempted to trash talk his way into getting big fights. For example, after John Jones submitted Dan Henderson in a friendly grappling contest to Submission Underground 2, Dylan's name was brought up in a fan poll as a potential future opponent for Jones. Here is how he responded. Directly copying Connor, posting the same two words during negotiations with Eddie Alvarez a couple of months prior. Now, to be fair, this strategy worked out pretty well for Connor, the biggest superstar in the history of MMA. But let's see what it did for Dennis, somebody who at that point hadn't even competed in the sport once. Him telling, telling me to uh, beg him, it was, just, it was kind of a douchey thing to do. And I felt like I was already 
a situation where I had not very much to gain. Not many people even know who he is. So um, I just felt like he was being a douchebag, and I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not gonna even entertain you. But this didn't stop Dylan from trying the same exact thing with just about every single fighter with a little bit of fame. Over the years, he's harassed everyone from Ben Askren to Francis Ngannou. Some fighters have fun with it and fire back at him. If no one knows who I am, why is every one of your tweets about me? You're most liked my you knob. Oh my, Dylan, just go away. You're pathetic. You are funny. I mean, I pity you. You want a joke, you want. But most just ignore him. And in the rare cases that he does annoy someone enough to engage him physically, he comes out looking like a fool. Like the time Jake Shields beat him in his own sport of jujitsu at Submission Underground 4. The same exact event that John Jones won against Dan Henderson. Or when Habib Nurmagomedov jumped out of the cage just to punch him in the face at UFC 229. He even tried to call out a couple of boxers, but the results were no less embarrassing. Ryan Garcia humored him on Instagram Live because before revealing what he actually wanted. If I beat you right in MMA, I'm saying, you know, I'll give you respect. I'm saying, yeah. can you work on the, uh, hey, Connor, Ryan, Ryan beat me. You gotta, you gotta, let's finish him. Like, let's get that work. <laughs> And Floyd Mayweather was so unaware of who Dylan was, even after being clowned by him on Twitter, that he took a picture with him thinking that he was just another fan. Judging by the caption, Dylan viewed this as some sort of a win. The saddest thing Dylan has done, though, is trying to punk internet influencers and failing miserably. At some point, he developed a beef with Jake Paul, where the two went back and forth for several months, mainly about setting up a boxing match, but also each other's girlfriends. Jake claimed to have hooked up with Dylan's girlfriend Savannah Montano in the past and Dylan taunted Jake over his friend Harry Jowsey dating Jake's girlfriend Julia Rose, implying that some things went down with all three of them when Jake and Julia were apart. Yo, Dylan Dennis's Instagram story has been reckless the past days. Him and Harry Jowsey, Jake will send guys to beat Harry up. Yeah, Lo that's what Logan was saying too, bro. He said Harry's gonna regret it. When Dylan was doing an interview for Food Truck Diaries, Jake did a drive-by and hit him with a bunch of water balloons and toilet paper. Hey, look, it's Conor McGregor's and as funny as that was, it was at this point that I actually started feeling bad for him. He went back to the interview and tried to pull the I'm a real fighter and I don't have time for these games card. It's like, I, it's just too many games with them, dude. Like, I, I don't like giving them the credit, like, or even the time of day is because, like, my goal in life is not to be Jake Paul. It's to be the best martial artist in the whole world, you know? That's what I want to yeah. do. So he's just, he's just there, you know? And he's just playing games and like, oh, do you want to do this? And we call it this. So it's like, he never actually, like... Weirdly oblivious to the fact that he engaged in plenty of games with Jake Paul and many others and only fought in Bellator twice against unknown competitors with terrible records, both of whom quit fighting after facing him. But the look in his eyes was instantly recognizable to anybody that got picked on when they were a kid. It was embarrassment. It was the look of somebody that just got violated. Who has water balloons? <laughs> I don't know. My son. My son. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody found him in his living room later on, punching the air like Cuba Gooding Jr. <laughs> Not being respected by fighters is one thing, but being an active fighter on the roster of a legit MMA organization and getting pelted by water balloons like you're a nerd getting picked on by the jocks in an 80s movie had to sting. At this point, he stopped receiving even the basic respect that comes with being somebody that fights for a living. Even Ariel Hawani, who in previous years interacted with him in a polite way, began roasting him right to his face with no regard for what he might do or say in return. Honor is the reason why anyone in MMA knows who you are. That's I didn't know true. who you were. That's not true. I legit Stop didn't it. know who you were before no he brought you in. I don't know where you were. What? I'm As if that wasn't enough, earlier this year, Dylan pulled out of a boxing match with British YouTuber KSI after repeatedly taunting him. The official reason was never stated, but his manager allegedly told KSI's team that he was unprepared. Got the answer from his team and his representatives that he is in fact pulling out, and they told me the reason, which was that he's underprepared. He was sick. Um, uh, apparently had COVID during uh, the time in Austin, which is a long time ago at this point. He attempted to claim that he was being unfairly set up via a rehydration clause in the contract, which apparently was the first thing in the contract, showing that he didn't even try to read it before signing it. They want me to be like four pounds a day, four pounds heavier the day of the fight by 4 p.m. 4 p.m. So the fight's at 7 or 8 o'clock, I don't know, and they want me to be weighing at 4 p.m. the day of the fight, only 4 pounds heavier. 
and or five pounds or something like something stupid. They, I don't know. It, I never even heard of this before. And if I, every pound that I don't make the weight on the second day, I get a penalty, which is very heavy. And when the rehydration clause was taken out per his request, he simply ghosted and it became apparent that he was just trying to use it as an excuse to pull out of the fight. And speaking of not reading contracts, a month later, he was exposed by YouTuber CoffeeZilla for promoting crypto scams on his Twitter after calling out Logan Paul for doing the same exact thing. He was tricked into posting a link that led to a page that exposed all of the other times he he scammed his followers. He tweeted it. <laughs> I can't believe he did it. He actually did it. He just tweeted it. What an idiot. What? He, I can't believe it. What can I say? He promoted a tweet which literally spells out in first letters the word scam. It also answered the question of how he manages to make money without fighting or having sponsorships. And this is where we're at currently. I try to pick only the most relevant events to help summarize both why he's disliked and why his reputation is in the dumps. I'm not exaggerating when I say that if I covered every single event that he was involved in, this video would be several hours long. Now let me play armchair psychologist for a second. Dylan Danis clearly idolizes Conor McGregor, but he's also said that he's a big fan of Prince Nassim Hamid med and chael sonnet that leads me to believe that he likes fighters with larger than life personalities fighters whose interviews and antics you want to watch just as much as their fights sometimes more fighters that have quotables showmen that explains his behavior he models himself after these guys and believes that he's cut from the same cloth he wants people to draw parallels between him and conor mcgregor the same way they do between nate and nick diaz like yes they're different people but they're similar in their behavior and they're both fan favorites but he is missing something that is key to having your antics be perceived as interesting versus cringe and annoying. Charisma. Dylan Dennis is not charismatic at all. He is a mush mouth with a monotone delivery who can barely put together a cohesive sentence and tends to stumble and stutter over his own words. No one brought knows you in. I don't know where you... What? Let's take a look at his interview after his first fight in Bellator, for example. I mean, at the end of the day... I'm the one that created all this. I did all the media. I built up this whole card. So all the bums on the rest of the card are going to call me out now. So now compare that to this clip of Connor, where he's essentially saying the same thing. I change your bum law. If you fight me, it's a celebration. Okay, I will beat you. When you sign to fight me, it's a celebration. You ring back home. You ring your wife. Baby, we done it. We're rich, baby. Connor McGregor made us rich. Break out the red panties. We're rich, baby. Now consider that Connor likely improvised this in the moment while Dylan sounds like he had prepared what he was going to say before the fight even started. There is no comparison. One guy clearly has a gift for putting words together in a creative way as well as public speaking while the other couldn't even give you a convincing book report. Dylan just doesn't have it. And that's okay. Ironically enough, if he just stopped trying to be something that he'll never be and acted like himself, people might find his story interesting. I know I did. So crazy. I have a lot of crazy things in my life. That's why a lot of people like to judge me, but they don't understand what I've been through, you know, so. Dylan was born to a Honduran mother and Armenian father. The family lived in New Jersey, but his father worked on Wall Street in New York and was very close to the World Trade Center on 9-11. I remember him coming home and he had his no whole way. body covered in, in wow. ashes and everything. It was, it was crazy. And How he, old were you? I was a fourth grade or fifth grade. So I was like very young and it was very weird for me because I remember watching it on the TV and then I remember him coming in and it was like serious. And later on in my life when I got older, he told me like, you know, he saw like people jumping and like arms Gosh. flying and it did f him up. But at the end of the day, you got to be able to persevere and, and kind of come over that stuff but you can't let it affect you like the way it affected him okay. and it kind of ruined his family you know so this early loss of a father figure might be the reason why dylan is seemingly so susceptible to imitating those he admires looking for a figure of authority that he can follow seems to be a running theme throughout his life I always had a lot of good dad figures in my life the guys that kind of steer me in the, in the right in the right path you know i was lucky with that he has three siblings but two are actually his cousins it's actually another crazy story i have a sister <laughs> okay yeah Oh, that's my real sister. And then I have a, a brother and another sister, but they're my cousins because her, the, their parents passed away and they ended up moving in with us. Wow. So it's like a crazy whole story, but I mean, those are, that's my family. Both parents passed away? My dad and his brother married two sisters. Okay. So yeah. they're two, they're kind of, you know, and the dad was, both of our dads were in our lives. And then when his mom passed, they moved in to us. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, are you guys close? Yeah, my brother's 
It's like my best friend, you know? Okay. And same thing with my sister. As a teenager, he decided to take jujitsu classes after being harassed and threatened by a group of kids in a school after winning a fight with a choke against one of their friends. I took him down and I put on like a rear naked choke and then like he tapped, you know, and everybody's like, what the fuck is that? Like, this is, this is not fighting. He actually tapped. Yeah, like, he tapped like, and then I let him go. So I was like home, you know, and I was like feeling pretty cool. I was like, yeah, I won this fight. And then like back then MySpace was like the thing. Okay. And I was getting messages like, they're like, we're gonna catch you before and jump you and kill you. And like, they were saying like some crazy shit. And I was like, this is scary, you know, like I don't want to get jumped. Sure. There was like tens of messages. Sure, sure, sure. So I was like, I need to learn how to fight. His future jujitsu coach, Marcelo Garcia, lived in the same apartment complex and would often have him over his house to play video games. Three doors away from each other. I used to go to his house, play video games, Grand Theft Auto. He used to make me acai. Later on, Dylan would go on to become one of his most promising students. Unfortunately, Marcelo would end up kicking him out of his gym in 2017, citing behavioral issues that were detrimental to the culture of the academy. Now, most people would assume that Dylan was in the wrong based on his public persona, but there might be more to the story. Marcelo wanted his students to present a certain image in public. He felt like bad behavior reflected on him poorly as a teacher and would discipline those he found to be problematic. But in at least one example, Dylan provided said discipline didn't always seem to be applied fairly i could i, I could give you an example of getting suspended once was giving a, pic, a a picture giving the finger on instagram and i got suspended for six months from my black belt and from the gym it was like a big deal right. i was dating a girl from i'm not dating a girl but i was with a girl from the gym okay and i'm not gonna say names obviously all right no problem and uh me she and was, her she was she was training at the gym yeah and she okay. came from brazil and she was living with me for like six months i think maybe maybe a little bit less but we were living together everything and then we stopped talking and one of the guys in the gym was like, yo, man, like, I'm talking to her. I'm trying to help you get back with her. And like, he was like, he was one of my friends. Then I, they posted a picture of them dating on uh, New Year's kissing. Okay. And I didn't know. And I was like, kind of, I was out on New Year's. I had a couple drinks. And then me and my friends, we put a picture. I gave him the finger just because I was in a bad mood. I'm 18, 19 at the time. And like World War Three happened. Like, boom, he, he, he almost, it was crazy. Like, I didn't, like, that's not even that big of a deal. Right, right, right. You know what right. I mean? Like, so that's like, hurt. That, that, that's a, uh, yeah, exactly. I was hurt. Imagine one of your friends saying that, and he was like giving me advice. He's like, "Yeah, I'm with her. I'm talking to her," and then that oh, happened. And I, and, and, you know, what? we're all human. Like I'm having a drink, and I get upset, and I'm like, "That's like a girl that was like living with me," and he gets mad at me for giving the face. Like you know what I mean? He should have got mad at the guy for doing that. That's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's grimy shit. Whether this account is accurate isn't clear, as Marcelo has never spoken publicly about this. But one thing is for sure: Dylan was extremely hurt by what transpired. It's, it's hard to talk about for me. Like I had a lot of nights where I cried. You know, that was that was my guy. You know, like um, he was my coach and everything. So it's hard for me to talk about. There seems to be two sides to Dylan Danis: the one the public knows and the one his friends and family knows. It's hard for me to picture him as a bad guy after hearing his story and seeing how he interacts with his mom and siblings online. They seem to have genuine love for one another and I can't picture him as this annoying and confrontational dude in those moments. It also needs to be mentioned that he's had a very difficult year. Leandro Lowe, one of his best friends, was murdered and his father passed away just as they were beginning to reconnect and that's besides all of the other drama that he was involved in. At this point, it might be time to step back, realize that he's only human and cut him some slack. I do think that he fell into the trap of presenting himself in a certain way and when that wasn't received as well as he had hoped, Instead of changing, he started doubling down on the behavior out of spite. I feel like he knows that people don't like him and find his antics annoying and at this point is using them as a defense mechanism that he disguises as trolling. And contrary to popular belief, he's not delusional. He sees the backlash and it does bother him. I mean, sometimes it does get like a little weird like going to the jiu-jitsu thing and like some people seem like they're just like so standoffish towards me, you know? Really? And uh, what tournament was this? This is the Kasai on Saturday. I almost got jumped oh. like three times. But yeah, sometimes that gets to me a little bit. But it's easier to accept that people don't like you when you're being purposely antagonistic. It hurts a lot more when people don't accept the real you. At this point, Dylan Danis is MMA's joke, but that doesn't mean that that will be his legacy forever. The problem is, is that he's put all of his energy into something that he's bad at, like talking, and almost none of it into something that he could potentially be good at, like fighting. No, he'll never be able to cut a promo like Conor McGregor, but neither could John. John Jones, George St. Pierre, Jose Aldo, Anderson Silva, or Fedor, and that never stopped them from achieving greatness. Greatness, a lot of the time, has humble beginnings, and I have yet to see anybody become great that started in Dylan's position, but everyone loves an underdog story.